art world of 1920s New York shimmers with promise in Fiona Davis's new novel, The Masterpiece, which takes place in one of the city's architectural jewels, Grand Central Terminal. I just love the setting, and so I did what I normally do, and I really dive into the research. And I learned that in the 1920s, the painter John Singer Sargent co-founded the Grand Central School of Art there, that it was there for 20 years, that there was 900 students a year, and no one knows about it. Davis also discovered a forgotten artist, Helen Dryden, whose gorgeous illustrations graced the covers of Vogue and other major magazines. Dryden was so famous in her day that when Studebaker hired her to design the interiors of its cars, the company featured her in its ads. She did costume design, she did industrial design, she you know, was named the highest paid female artist in America, and then she disappears. In the masterpiece, Dryden's life is reimagined in the characters of Clara Darden, an ambitious young artist who teaches at the school, and Virginia Clay, a fallen socialite who was forced to take a job at Grand Central in 1974 after a divorce. I'm so interested in tracking how women's voices and agency have changed over time, or how they haven't. And for Virginia in the 70s, even though the Equal Rights Amendment, you know, they're hoping it's gonna get passed, it's still a time when you're defined by whether or not you have a man. Davis began that conversation in her first novel, The Dollhouse, about New York's famed Barbizon Hotel for Women. And she continued it in The Address, set inside the legendary Dakota apartment building. Davis's books are also love letters to her adopted city, where she moved after college to pursue a career on the stage before shifting to journalism and writing. It really felt like a mix of acting and journalism. So you're telling a story and you're doing research and then you end up with a book. <laughs> Find out how Davis did that and where her next novel will take us in this edition of First Person, one-on-one -on -one with Fiona Davis, presented by St. Louis County Library, The Novel Neighbor, and HEC Media. Fiona Davis, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. We're in this gorgeous spot to Craft Alliance and University City, surrounded by art, which is perfect for your story. Tell us about the masterpiece. Sure, so the masterpiece takes place at Grand Central Terminal in two different time periods. So it's historical fiction. Part of it is set in the 1920s and it takes place at the Grand Central School of Art um, with a, a faculty member who's trying to really make her way. And then the second timeline is the 1970s. And that's um, from the point of view of this kind of down on her luck, um, former Upper East Side socialite type um, who has to take a job as a clerk in the info booth. And those two stories go back and forth and eventually um, they're braided together. And there's an element of mystery of um, trying to figure out what happened to a painter from the 1920s and as well as looking into a painting. Is it a masterpiece? Is it valuable or is it not? In this case, you were exploring an area that a lot of New Yorkers think they really know, but you found out yourself how many secrets are, are in Grand Central too. Yeah, I, that's what I loved is when I initially decided to do Grand Central, I thought, well, I'm not sure. You know, how's this gonna work? It's not a residence, people don't live there. They go in and out. You know, how, I, I just really wasn't sure. Um, yeah, unless you work there, you don't spend a concentrated amount of time. Yeah, you know, I was like, oh, well, there'll be a love scene between two commuters. <laughs> I, I don't know. Right, where? Right. <laughs> but, but I just love the setting. And so I did what I normally do, and I really dive into the research. And I learned that in the 1920s, the painter John Singer Sargent co-founded the Grand Central School of Art there, that it was there for 20 years, that there was 900 students a year, and no one knows about it. And once I knew that, I thought, okay, that's my way in. Why did it sort of fade into a, a sort of, not a secret, but a footnote almost? I, you know, I think it, it was a right around the end of World War II. And so I think people were just on to different things. There was a, a gallery as well at Grand Central and that moved across to the Biltmore Hotel. And so things changed, you know, CBS moved in and put in a TV studio there. 
in the 60s. Oh, okay. Um, so. You know, there's a tennis court. So, so there's always these odd things going on there. Life moved on and... Yeah, yeah. 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 And it was a really significant school in terms of a lot of really significant names sort of passed through there as either instructors or students, right? Arshel Gorky started as a student and became a teacher. Charles Adams from the Adams family fame, he was a student there. It, um, it was quite illustrious. You have a really interesting story too, just on how you even came to feature Grand Central. Tell me about that. Did it come from a reader? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was doing a book talk for my first book. And um, one of the people there came up to me after and said, you know, if you like, I can get you a behind the scenes tour of Grand Central, since clearly you like landmark buildings. And I said, yeah, that's my thing. OK. And, um, and I met her and we were given hard hats and we went all over. Uh, we kind of tagged along with this architectural group. And we went up to the catwalks that are between these enormous windows on the east side. We went really far below to these, you know, an abandoned train car that belonged to FDR. It, it was just amazing. And, and so we really learned a lot of interesting things about the nooks and crannies. And it was enough to, to set me on my way. Was your mind just spinning on that tour? It, it's basically terror <laughs> because you think there's so much I don't know and there's so much work and especially once I realized I wanted to center it around the Grand Central School of Art you know I took an art history class in college it's not something that is my background but I think as a journalist you just know okay I can make myself an expert in any subject with just some effort and I interview people I really get out in the field I am um, I toured uh, an art school in New York, the Art Students League, that's been there for over 100 years now, just to get a sense of what it might have seemed like, um, what it smelled like, you know, what's it like to have the students wandering around the halls, and what's the energy. And so for me, it's fun to get out and, you know, talk to people. And that's where all the interesting ideas come from. So it's not just on the internet and looking at books. Did you realize that day I have to do something with this or did that come it later? Came, you know, it came later. It came when I read about the school. Um, and that's when I thought, okay, I can do this. If I find the right characters and if I get guidance and really, you know, I, I knew someone who's an illustrator, so I knew I could talk to someone about art um, and, and kind of find my way. You usually, your characters are purely fictional. In this case, you did base them, right, on, on two, two of the artists. Uh, I did. I couldn't help myself because they were so fascinating. I could see that as I read more. I don't want to give it away, too, but as I read more, especially about Helen Dryden, I thought, oh, my gosh, there's no way you could read this and not think I have to do something. Exactly. And so Helen Dryden um, was recommended to me by an architectural historian who I was interviewing. And he said, you know, if you're looking at Grand Central School of Art, look at Helen Dryden. And, you know, she came to New York. She was an illustrator. She did all these Vogue magazines from the 1920s with these gorgeous, gorgeous. Oh, yeah, gosh, very yeah. stylized. Yeah. When you, you know, Google her, you're just blown away. Yeah. By what she created. She, and, but she didn't stop there. She did costume design. She did industrial design. She, you know, was named the highest paid female artist in America. And then she disappears. And so her story was so fascinating um how it went and i you know i didn't i'm inspired by her not based on her um so i'm not giving anything away but i just thought this is a woman who's been lost to history and maybe by creating my character clara it will interest people in the woman behind the character and let people find out more about her tell me more too about these two main characters we have clara darden and virginia yeah, so Clara Darden, um, she comes to New York from Arizona and she comes as a student to the Grand Central School of Art but quickly gets made a teacher. But it's hard because she's teaching illustration and no one really gives her the respect she deserves because she's a woman. And she gets to meet two men. One is Oliver, who is um, one of the, the models at the school. And um, he represents safety. He comes from a good family. He really wants to support her in what she does. And then she meets Levon, who's this fiery, crazy, you know, Armenian faculty member. And, and they kind of, they all get caught up in, in a city 
and an art world that's in flux between the heady days of the Roaring Twenties and then the oncoming depths of the Depression. It's interesting too because these two women in two very different time periods and yet they're both defined by whether or not they marry, who they marry. It was kind of chilling too to read the limitations that that, that placed on them. Yeah, I'm so interested in tracking how women's voices and agency have changed over time or how they haven't. And so when you're dealing with those two time periods, the 20s, sure, women were you know wearing shorter dresses and had more freedom but still you were defined by the man you were with. And for Virginia in the 70s, even though the Equal Rights Amendment, you know, they're hoping it's gonna get passed, um, is going on, it, it's still a, a time when you're defined by whether or not you have a man. And to me, it's important for both characters to be able to take care of themselves. And it's chilling to see the double jeopardy of that, right? Okay, so you can follow the rules and get married, and then in Virginia's case, it can go badly and you find yourself worse off than before. Yeah. And, you know, even, you know, today I live on in New York and you see friends who have really put everything into their marriages and their children and they find themselves at a loss either when the kids grow up and get married or if they get divorced and they have to really reconfigure their identity. And so it still can go on. When you look at these characters, in the beginning, it doesn't look like they have a ton in common. And yet, as the story develops and you see the challenges they face as females in their particular time period, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and I think, you know, on, on First Value, they do seem so different because Claire is tough and kind of overconfident. And Virginia's the opposite. She was married in the 50s. She has a surly teenage daughter. Um, you she's know, been she, beaten down a bit. She's been beaten down and she's, you know, gone through a bad divorce and is not doing so well and, and is pretty insecure. And for both of them, it's through art and through kind of looking outward that they find themselves and find success. And, and for Virginia in the seventies, it's about, um, getting caught up in the fight to save Grand Central because it was under great threat at that point and about to be pretty much destroyed. Um, by developers. And Jackie O, of course, stepped in to try and save it. And so for that character, Virginia, it's by looking outward. And and again, looking at Grand Central as a masterpiece. Is it worth saving? Or is it, you know, uh, is it not worth anything? So in addition to the character stories here, we also have this development that comes up with Grand Central being threatened. Yes, yeah, exactly. So in the 70s, um, some developers wanted to destroy Grand Central. Basically, they wanted to put a 55-story skyscraper on top and then put all of the train station stuff underground. And they'd done this before with Penn Station, which was this cathedral of glass and cast iron that was demolished in the 60s. And it wasn't until it was destroyed that people thought, well, wait, maybe we should have done something. And luckily, that helped Grand Central in that people knew that that they could lose it. And they really started wondering about it. And so even though there was no money in the city's coffers to try and fight back and save the terminal, um, a committee was pulled together headed by Jackie O and some famous architects and some some the mayor. And they decided to try to save it. Um, and it was it was a real 11th hour effort. So this is your third novel. Did that feel like a milestone to you in terms of two down now? Uh, does, does it, I don't know what it is about the third book always seems to me like the, like it's on the, I don't know, crossing the brink of something. Is that right? Definitely. I, I definitely think so because you've learned enough to not be afraid. And I think each book I grow as a writer and I learn more and I've, you know, so each book is more and more satisfying and less terrifying. Um, and this one, just as I was writing it, it just felt right. Like I, I thought to myself, you know, even if no one else likes this book, I love it. <laughs> and and that hadn't happened before because you're always wondering, well, will you know the editors or the what will everybody think? What will the reviewers think? And this one was one that I thought I like it, and that's that's enough. 
Yeah, I would imagine with your first novel, uh, that's got to be really scary to stick to your own voice, but you want it to succeed and you want the people that have put their faith in you to be happy with it. And Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, every book is a real team effort. So you have agent, you, you have an editor, you have a great publicity team. And so for me, it's all women on that team. And it is such an incredible group. We recently met at, at Grand Central and had a, a drink at the Campbell apartment to celebrate the third book. And it really felt great because, you know, you're, I'm not alone. I have this incredible tribe behind me who are, who are doing everything they can to make it work. And your fan base too. Oh my gosh. I mean, you hope for that uh, and you write for that. And yet, have you been surprised at how devoted they are. You can tell from the social media, they just are so excited to have this new novel out. Like. Yeah, it's been so much fun going on tour this week because I've, I've really gone around from Columbus, Ohio to San Francisco to LA and now St. Louis. And it, it's, you know, I, I keep a, a list of all the people I've met on Facebook who are coming to each event so I can make sure I say hi and thank you. Hi. 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 Because it's these people who you, you get to know as they you know read your book and like it and go off and review it and tell their friends. And that's the wonder of social media. It, it's terrific for an author who stays at home writing all day. <laughs> so tell me about your evolution as a writer. You grew up in, you said your parents are from England, right? Tell me about your childhood. You kind of grew up with a, a feet in both worlds, I guess, or a foot in both worlds, I should say, uh, different cultures and different um, yeah. traditions and such. Um, we, we traveled around a lot. So I was born in Canada, but raised in New Jersey and Utah, and then back to New Jersey. And then at the moment, my parents live in, in Texas, and they've been there for a while now. Um, and so it was about, you know, trying to fit in and figure out, okay, wh who am I and how does this work? And so after college, I went to New York, um, where I, I had some friends there and became an actress. And I think it's because I just, you know, knew how to kind of fit in wherever I had to go. And I thought, all right, let's see if we can make a, a career out of that. Was reading a refuge for you as well with all these changes? No question. Um, my mother would bring us to the library every week and we'd buy, we'd, we'd get, you know, at least three books. And I loved Agatha Christie and Laura Ingalls Wilder and you know, I, I loved a good book. And definitely that was a, a refuge when I was trying to figure out how I fit in in the world. What led you to acting? I auditioned for a play in high school and really enjoyed it. And then acted a little in college. And, um, you know, it was sort of like, yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> and um, I'm sure my parents were, you know, not happy, but they were very supportive. And it was wonderful because I got in with a group of actors and, you know, we did one show that went from off off Broadway to Broadway in one season and was nominated for a Tony. And those are all my best friends still today. What was your life like as a young actress in New York? What era would that was that I guess would that have been? In? That was this, yeah. the late 80s to late 90s. So it was about a, a decade in my 20s. And um, it was still possible to live in New York, right? And oh, yeah. Kind of be struggling, but still have it right now. It's yeah. not really. Oh yeah, I had a I had a studio with a working fireplace um, for five hundred dollars. Oh month. my gosh, right, a huge it was, luxury. It now, was great. Right? Yeah, I can yeah. only imagine now. And so it was livable. And so you could do a job um, during the day, and then you auditioned, and then we put on three shows a year. And I did Broadway and off Broadway and regional theater. Um, and that kind of thing. It was, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. How and why did you shift toward journalism and writing then from that? You know, I noticed as I was getting older that my friends who were a little older than I were, who were women, weren't working as much. And the men, as they aged, just got more and more character there were roles. were still parts or, for them, right? Yeah. And I, I thought, well, that's not good. And I thought, well, what else do I want to do? And I applied to Columbia Journalism School and got in, which was I thought, okay, I'll go do that now. <laughs> and um, very, very driven. <laughs> and um, very and, scientific uh, yeah, decision, right. right? I just wandered from one thing into another. But it all, it all galvanized and you know ended up in storytelling. Into storytelling, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I loved Columbia. I had an amazing time, and you really learn how to craft a, a story. And I wrote my thesis there about the shelf life of a New York actress and how you know how the roles do fade out, at least at that point, um, for, for women. 
Um, and so that was great. So I could merge my two loves. When did the idea of the book start to take shape that uh, you wanted to shift into writing novels? And, and, and once you did decide that, how did you make that happen? That's always the hardest leap for yeah. any author. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I started, I got this idea for the Barbizon book, as I call it, and, um, and worked on a manuscript. And I, I was able to get an agent um, and we worked on it together to really get it into shape and then got an editor and then I was off in a new direction. And I think it helped that that all happened when I was in my late 40s because you know, you're, not, you're not scared and you're eager to take advantage of whatever chances you have, but you don't feel like you're owed anything. You know, it's just a different perspective um, when you've had some life behind you. And I, I enjoyed doing it so much, it really felt right. It really felt like a mix of acting and journalism. So you're telling a story and you're doing research and then you end up with a book. <laughs> I wonder too how your acting background and, and just staging and setting the scene and all that, how that affects your writing. I think it does help because if a character is in distress, you, you can kind of tap into it in a visceral level. Um, you know, often if I have a character who needs to be doing something, I'll do it myself. I'll make some gesture or something so I can figure out how to explain what's going on in her interior life in a, in a physical manifestation. Um, but really it is, it's about stage directing too, of having a scene and being able to see it and move people where they need to go and, you know, have someone have a coffee cup but not drop it. And, you know, just kind of creating a story um, that, that you can see in your head. What's your writing process like? Uh, you Sounds like you've already written your next. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do about a book a year and um, I research for about three months and then I write a, a I figure it out. I, my, parent, my parents are both engineers, so I take a very scientific approach and I figure out who the characters are and um, what they want and then what they need to do and what can get in their way. So a lot of development. Do it. Yeah, a lot of, of their that. backstory. Mm -hmm. And then figure out how to weave it together. And then I work off that on a first draft. And I write a pretty fast first draft. I don't look back and just get something down that I can then shape. It's like, you know, clay. You just need something down that then you can fine tune and add to. And, and that's where I am right now in the, the new book. Um, where you're kind of fine tuning and layering onto it. And that to me is so much fun. You mentioned earlier that sometimes you need to get some distance from your story and what you're writing. And is that, you mentioned that is kind of the case now too with the masterpiece, I mean, with the uh, transcript or. Yeah, with uh, the, the, the next book. Yeah, so the next book, it has a name. It's called The Chelsea Girls. And it takes place at the Chelsea Hotel. And I was wondering if you would tell us. Yeah, no, sure. I didn't know if you tried oh, to keep yeah. that secret. Or, oh, okay. I, I'll say anything. <laughs> um, and so the Chelsea Hotel was this amazing, it is this amazing hotel on 23rd Street that was full of artists and poets, Dylan Thomas, Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, Leonard Cohen. Um, the list of, of people who've stayed there is, is crazy. And it's eccentric and it's odd. And, um, but very artistic. Patti Smith lived there and she wrote about it in her book, Just Kids. And so it's set in the 1950s from the points of view of um, a director uh, or a, a playwright and an actor, both women who are good friends, who are trying to put a show on Broadway during the McCarthy era. And so that's been really interesting of, of, of researching the McCarthy era and what happened and certain parallels to today. And it's been quite fascinating. So it's the 50s and then it jumps to the late 60s. As a writer, are you thinking about the reader when you're writing, or are you sort of sort of trying to answer your own questions or or, or sort of sussing out your own path? And... Yeah, that's such a good question. I, I I think I'm I'm I get caught up in the characters. And so I feel like if I'm having a good time, the reader probably will too. And so as long as I'm interested, if I'm writing a scene and I'm kind of tired of it, that's not good. Because the reader will be tired of it. What is it that you feel like you really are truly trying to explore? You know, for me, it's about, um, it's about being able to be an independent woman in the world who's doing something really creative and really fulfilling and not being defined by being a wife or a mother. Um, you know, I'm divorced, I live alone, and it's great. I highly recommend it. <laughs> 
um, because I have freedom and I'm no longer taking care of people, although that's wonderful. Um, but for me, that's when really everything came together and my career took off and I just found this joy in life. And I think men are allowed to, to do that and women often are considered a little, you know, quirky if they do that. And I'm embracing it. I'm going for it. And you're seeing that resonate with your audience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, for me, it's about characters who don't end up happily ever after with a picket fence. It's more complicated. And life is more complicated. And, and richer. Yeah. And that's what I want to capture. Thank you so much, Fiona Davis. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.